everyone to our next session, which is going to take us to space, as we're going to look at what space age technologies might be able to help us fight climate change here on Earth. So what current innovations are being developed that could also play a role in pushing for clean energy? That is what the next fireside chat, the next group of people is going to focus in on. And I'm very glad to welcome Dr. Thorst Müller, who is the group manager for modeling and simulation at Fraunhofer Umsicht, who will be hosting this discussion. He's really a senior researcher in this topic, so the perfect expert to host the discussion, Space for Sustainability, Infrastructure and Data-Enabled Decarbonization. Over to you, Thorsten. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, for our fireside threat, um, space for sustainability, space infrastructure, and data enabled decarbonization. And we have two speakers with um, Sascha Deutsch from the European Space Agency and Tobias Engelmeyer, founder of Village Data Analytics. And um, I think you both can introduce yourselves. Sascha, please start. Yeah, thank you very much. So my name is Sascha Deutsch. I'm a business analyst at the European Space Agency, working for the ESA downstream gateway. So what is my department doing? On one hand, we are looking at space assets and their capabilities. So we call it the upstream, everything what is in space, Earth observation, Copernicus, navigation, so that's Galileo in Europe, but also telecommunication for connectivity mm -hmm. and space enabled 5G human space flight related technologies and potential technology transfer and on the other hand we look at downstream sectors like energy what are the trends what are the needs and who are the most important actors with whom it's possible to work what are potential collaborations for new projects um, on the commercial side or on the research side and tobias hi um I'm Tobias Engelmeyer. I'm an entrepreneur and I've been working on the topics of climate change and climate justice for more than 10 years. I lived in India for a long time where I built two companies and one other in Africa. And with the kind of knowledge of working in remote areas, um, we then teamed up with uh, ESA and other um, data experts to build village data analytics, which I'll talk about later. Maybe a few words to the slide on the oh. <laughs> Okay, later. Um, uh, Sasha, when we uh, talk about the space technology infrastructure, um, how important are new technologies in space to combat climate change? And um, what are the main innovation from your opinion? Okay, I think first of all, I'm thinking about uh, how satellites had been monitoring our our Earth and our environment already since the 80s and 90s. If you think back, uh, the first uh, holes in the ozone layer had been identified through satellites or monitoring Arctic sea ice, permafrost, glaciers. So all this is very important and had been done actually through space. And also, if you think about um, how to characterize our Earth's climate, we have uh, the essential climate variables and 60% of those can be monitored by space. So we have general historic data already for several decades. And uh, to understand the, the past, the present, but also the future with regional or general climate models. And it's much more than an academic exercise because it's crucial for public and private investments. And a good keyword is here also the digital twin Earth project. So a digital version of our planet to combine Earth observation, in situ measurements, and artificial intelligence. So for me, um, climate change and space is, is very much interlinked by, by monitoring um, greenhouse gases and uh, and also climate but perhaps to bring this on a more practical level and also to make it understandable for for the energy sector satellite images are, are neutral and and objective so there's a great chance for data collection verification policy monitoring and in the end even enforcement um as i said we can monitor greenhouse gases air quality from methane no2 co2 on national level on regional level and with increasing resolution partially also on asset level and um, i think this is going to be a game changer for the energy industry for carbon offsetting it's an alternative for policymakers for data collection 
and it will have an impact probably also on emission trading systems or even carbon border adjustment mechanism. So all traditional aspects of what satellites had been doing in the sense of environmental impact assessments are becoming more and more relevant for, for the sector. Questions of biodiversity, de deforestation, um, water resource management, river health, oceans, all this can be can be supported by space. And uh, I, I think in general, with, with increasing complexity, um, but also dependency of, of renewable energy in, in the in the system, increasing dependency on, on weather makes space more and more relevant because we can supply, forecast, predict renewable energy and uh, looking at sunshine, wind, wave will be more and more important or water streams. So we can support to increase the resilience of the whole yeah. energy system. And uh, I think it's not only relevant on the supply side, um, but also on the demand side. So mapping access to electricity, for example, in remote areas. But I'm sure Tobias will be able to tell us much, much more about this. Um, perhaps what I'm thinking most of when it comes to innovation is um, renewable energy generation itself. So location identification, spatial planning, looking where to put solar power plants or panels for cities, for individuals, understanding wind flows uh, offshore, onshore, um, wave energy to understand uh, ocean waves, so where to identify locations, but also to, to, to look at melting ice, for example, in the mountains to understand the output of, of hydro energy, um, geothermal location identification. So it's very much about finding appropriate areas um, where, where space can help um, either directly companies or regional or, or, or national actors, and, and often also even in, in remote areas. Um, it's 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 quite important, but but um, on the other hand, also the forecast or the operation. Um, if we think about changing Fed and tariffs or the need for for bankability estimations, so there's still a lot of work to do to 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 better integrate forecast for the next hours, for the next days, in, into energy production. And um, yeah, despite renewable energies being sustainable. Still, the question of environmental impact monitoring or the protection of, of animals um, on, on the shore, but also offshore, bird routes, uh, fish populations. So there have been several projects been done in this area, and it's quite interesting. But um, yeah, we shouldn't only be limited actually to, to Earth observation because there's also connectivity, there's also GNSS. So looking at maintenance or drones for inspections, a lot of communication aspects, right? We will need more data. We will need more data in remote areas. Um, so ensuring this communication, but also asset monitoring and tracking um, will be even more important. And talking about monitoring, I think grid monitoring is a very fascinating field with a lot of advancements recently. So we can look at vegetation or weather events, snow, ice load, wind, to, to have these incidents automatically been detected actually um, on the grids, overhead lines, cables or, or pylons. Um, this is something that was very fascinating, where you don't have to send a local crew or a helicopter, but you can already identify how important is the incidence from space. And uh, this is also quite relevant for, for pipelines, for huge pipeline networks, if we're looking at methane leakages, to identify them early on, which is good for the environment, but also for, for the business model <laughs> in the end um, of the operator. So, so thinking about this, thinking also about um, network and time synchronization through GNSS, I, I think we will see a lot more of, of these applications coming up and, and raising in importance. And as mentioned before, the whole aspect of ESG, environmental social governance, to increase transparency, trust, also on the financing side, not only on the operational side, which is becoming more and more important or difficult to obtain because it's not only about putting more green energy, it's also to make brown energy more green. So we also need here uh, trustable and, and transparent cases. Perhaps just a last good example, because uh, it's something I, I really like. It's a space-based uh, solar power, because we have a, a lot of um, challenges on Earth when it comes to, to solar energy. So there's this idea already since decades, what if we could collect solar power up in space and beam it down to the surface of, of the Earth? Because we have up to 11 times more intense um, sunlight, 24-7 uh, available, 
And so ESA is, is seeking ideas, technologies, and, and concepts. So whatever ideas out there, we are, we are very interested in, in hearing your ideas on this. So I, I hope I could give you some food for thoughts on this and uh, some ideas of, of ongoing activities. Thank you. And um, Tobias, you're more on the side of usage and um, how can space infrastructure and data enable electrification, decarbonization, and what are the use cases for satellite data um, that you see, for example? Yeah, thank you, Torsten, and thank you, Sasha. Um, the, we're really working at the intersection of a couple of huge changes. One is, of course, climate change as a kind of need and a requirement. A second one is all the changes we're experiencing in electricity and electric, electricity generation, especially distributed generation. It's a, it's a, you know, falling prices, but it's also the robustness and ability to implement energy solutions, especially around solar everywhere in the world. And, uh, and, and another, and the, and the third one is, um, is exactly this. It's, it's, it's the, I would say more broadly, the data revolution, but um, a key part of this is um, played by satellites. Um, and, you know, then there is the, the, the processing, the compute, the, the AI algorithms behind it, data products that are becoming available. So the amount of information that is becoming available is stunning and it's growing very fast. And we have built a business in Village Data Analytics in channeling these kind of the, the, this data and making it useful to people who want to work in especially electrification. So our work mostly is in Africa and Asia. Um, to understand why that matters, it's important to kind of take a step back. Uh, we all live hyper-connected worlds, uh, in a hyper-connected world. We um, order our food online and uh, probably can't find the way to the nearest train station without using Google Maps. Um, if you think for a moment uh, of a different world uh, that is largely unmapped, and therefore um, data dark, you could say, it's also electricity dark. Uh, these are remote villages in um, Africa, Asia, some other parts of the world. Altogether, there are about 2 billion people living there. And these worlds are beginning to change, uh, beca partially because of the other two um, revolutions that I mentioned before. So we're seeing investment requirements or investment interest um, into different things, into internet provision, into expansion of e-commerce, into value chains, buying more products like coffee or cotton from there, etc. But one of the cornerstones, if not the cornerstone of this, is the provision of energy in these parts of the world. Um, there are about 800 million people, depending on how you count it, who have zero access to modern energy. So they burn wood mostly um, and there are about three billion and that's really important in the world that have very insufficient access to energy so that stymies that stifles how they, they their ability to live not only modern lives but also to become part of a modern economy which allows them to develop and grow and earn um, so um, the problem is that you know there's a lot of investment interest also from governments um, around 40 billion a year we estimate but without data, without information on how to invest this, um, how to uh, make the right investment choices, measure investment, measure impact, this is very, very difficult to do. And that's why we have built Village Data Analytics. Um, with Village Data Analytics, we can take, actually, by the way, you can put in the slide now if you want, uh, whoever is responsible. Yeah, that's great. With Village Data Analytics, we, um, we identify villages in an automated way using satellite imagery and algorithms that we've developed. Um, and we put information about them on a map that makes them visible in the first place to planners and investors. It makes them comparable um, <clears throat> and it makes them investment ready in different ways. Uh, so we can extract information just purely from satellite imagery um, around how big a village is, how it grows, um, how many houses it has, what type of house, uh, road infrastructure, is it connected to the grids? We've developed algorithms that understand where the existing grid is and how reliable it is, which is an ex you know, creates a very important bottom line for electrification work and, and more, right? And then we can add other data layers, uh, climate risk data layers, political risk data layers, et cetera. Um, so that we give to our users and then our users add their own data layers to it. So we are marrying 
top-down information that comes from um, ESA, among others, um, with bottom-up data that comes from our users. This could be survey information, it can be pictures like you see here on the, on the, on the, on the slide, it can be designs, plans, it could be, um, it could be sensor data, that's uh, smart meter data or other sensor data. Um, so bringing all this together kind of unlocks the real value of, in our mind, of all these huge new data sources that are available, both top down and bottom up actually. And for the first time in these places, um, we can create a reliable, up-to-date connection between information and location at a granularity that really matters. So the value of the, the precision and granularity increases exponentially for uh, investors and decision makers who need to make decisions around these areas. Um, currently, this is used by, as I said, by governments, by uh, banks, by who access risk, governments who do policy planning with it, and uh, companies that want to electrify. We went live in uh, February this year only and uh, I've already worked in 15 countries and three continents. Um, there are many ongoing projects. To give you an example that really fits with the energy and, and climate conversation today, we're already looking at larger settlements um, in Africa, for example, in parts of Sudan, Ethiopia, or uh, Congo, um, hundreds of thousands of people um, off the grid with a significant amount of diesel genset cap 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 um, capacity. Um, with many, many people completely kind of um, without modern energy. Um, and now we're working with both, interestingly, companies and governments and banks at the same time to find out how to create a sustainable um, energy infrastructure for these large areas. Um, and uh, that requires exactly what we do. That requires gathering a lot of on-ground data and connecting that intelligently with, um, with, the, with the satellite data. Without doing something like what we are doing, um, I don't see how we are able to provide energy access to large parts of the globe uh, within the time frame we set ourselves, 2030, but it's just fundamentally important for people to have energy in order to have education, healthcare, and all kinds of other basic commodities that we know. Um, so it's very, very difficult for us to achieve that. Um, and if we, um, if we add these kind of data sets and we put them into, into, into a usable format and then add energy access on top of it, we are able to achieve very important other goals, such as modernizing agriculture, such as, as I said before, ele electrifying healthcare, um, which is really important, for example, if you react to, if you want to fight malaria or COVID. Um, electrifying education um, and ultimately making these large parts of the world more resilient to climate change. So it's also a climate justice topic. Without energy, without modern energy, it's very, very difficult for these populations to res be resilient to the effects of climate change to which they have contributed almost nothing um, and of which they are the most, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 one of the key victims. Um, and that allows them to build sustainable economies and lives in place, right? So it doesn't, so, so that, that forestalls migration. So all of this is a very complex kind of topic. We're just a part of it, but it is unlocked through a, I would call it a data revolution that ESA has contributed a lot to, that other people have contributed to, uh, that allows this kind of precise decision making. Thank you. And um, yeah, reliability is a very important point for decision making. And um, there, are, the, the question is about how accurate is the satellite data collection, and are there ethical problems when you use um, satellite data for um, in this way for for decisions? Sasha. Um. Perhaps just in general, and I'm, I'm very curious also to hear what Tobias is saying. I mean, it depends very much on the user requirements, their different aspects, their different use cases. Perhaps just in general, for images, we have to differentiate between the sensor types or the spectral resolution, what you can see, the spatial res resolution, so the detail of the, of the image, and then, of course, temporal resolution. So how often do you have a revisiting time of a certain place? 
And then, of course, on top you have uh, clouds or no clouds, uh, image taken on daytime or at nighttime. So there are a lot of questions around this. And uh, of course, it depends also on the availability and, and the cost. Um, in Europe, we have the Copernicus services, which are, which are available around a spatial resolution of 10 meters, but then there are also commercial offers which have a much more precise um, resolution. So normally you would mix different data sources to, to come to the, to the, to, to the, to, to come to an answer to the question that you have at hand. Um, about the ethics uh, around it, um, I mean, with a spatial resolution of 10 meters, I wouldn't be too too worried. It's it's hard to see what you have on your plate. Um, I think uh, social media or mobile phones uh, can be quite different with regard to this. <laughs> What's your opinion, Tobias? So I would say that to begin with, data is a very, very powerful tool. Um, without qualitative measures. So we can use it for different ways. One of the biggest customers of satellite imagery is the military, right? Still, because they really want it and they use it for their purposes. Um, but it's also really, it, it, it's, it's almost unimaginable to, to, to think of how to provide good electric energy access or healthcare strategies around you know, these big epidemics or pandemics even. Um, without data. So we've seen during the COVID years um, that how useful data can be in helping us overcome a challenge. So fundamentally, data can be used in different ways. We as a company um, have chosen to use our tool, which we recognize as a powerful tool, for the achievement of the sustainable development goals. That's our path, that's our goal, and that's, uh, and that's you know, ingrained both our culture and, um, and in our investor landscape. So um, that's really, really important. So there's a choice you made at how you use this tool, at what problem you want to address this. Then if you go down further, there are all kinds of other important issues. For example, um, if we build AI algorithms that are, autom that, that are image recognition algorithms and that feed into policy processes, there is a challenge of biases, right? That if, if the people are um, all kind of white guys like me sitting in Germany, we might make unconscious, we might insert unconscious biases into a tool that is used in an entirely different context. So one answer for us is that we are building out our AI capabilities in the target markets. Um, we've just brought on board two AI engineers from Benin, for example. Um, and, uh, you know, then, then there's other questions. It's like, what happens if uh, a user uses, uses it, you know, the, the data for a purpose that we're not aware of. Um, we have technology and contractual ways of prohibiting that. But I think the fundamental, the basic question about data is not really whether, um, or satellite imagery, is not whether it is good or bad, but it is how do we use it in a good way? And how do we ensure that this, that, that use case is not corrupted, if that's what we want, which is our goal. Thank you. And um, yeah, you both showed um, that there are a lot of possible ways to use um, the data and, and the infrastructure. And so um, what challenges and um, obstacles you see in the provision and um, usage of um, space infrastructure and data. First, Sasha. Yeah, I, I think we, as you said, we've heard a lot of great chances and great examples um, today. So in the end, it's also about the awareness about it. We have uh, increasing capabilities uh, every day, every week. There are new possibilities, especially on the data science side. So to have this knowledge and to think about examples, to think about specific use cases is, is quite important. So there are also on our website, there are quite some examples, but, but also like um, events like today to bring different communities together because the space industry is not always thinking about energy, energy not always about space when it comes to innovation. Um, R&D, but also funding possibilities. So I think it's to speak, speak the same language, start projects and um, establish relationships, their first prototypes, demonstrators, and, and then the, the, there's, there's much more to, to come. I'm, I'm very sure about this. Tobias, the same, same question. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, not much to add to what Sasha has been saying. I completely agree. There is an enormous, I mean, that's what I said in the beginning, there's an enormous increase in the quality and quantity of data we can use. 
And that allows us to make much, much better decisions, which is a key part of fighting climate change globally. Um, and it's a key part of the developmental landscape that we work in. Um, maybe just a small addition, I can highly recommend the uh, ESA business applications process of which we were a part. Um, and it's been very, very important for us to truly unlock uh, the power of, 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 the, of the available data and connect that to the use cases that we have. Yeah, so we, <laughs> it's a very interesting um, chat, but um, we are near the end. And um, when we look at our title, Space for Sustainability, vielleicht uh, um, possible you have both um, a short statement um, when you related to this um, title of, of our session. So at first, uh, Sasha. Yeah, I, I like the, the, the words of, of public policy, the environmental part, uh, giving support for decision making. And I think we have a lot of hot topics from offshore energy to, to ESG. And we are at a crossroad where space capabilities or data science capabilities are, are increasing at the same time. The energy sector is in a transformation also and becoming more digital, more dependent on the our environment or being more aware also about this. And I can say from, from either side, we are looking stronger at uh, commercialization with the agenda 2025, pre-commercialization and uh, different opportunities for businesses. So please feel free to, to, to get in touch if you have ideas, if you got inspired. Um, our colleagues from Earth Observation, Navigation, Business Application, as mentioned by Tobias, and of course the ESA Big Network and all around uh, Europe is open to collaborate for with public organizations, private corporate startups or research. So yeah, looking forward for more, I said before. Thank you. And a uh, short statement of you from, from you, Tobias? Short statement. Yeah, so um, <laughs> maybe two things. One is let's not be afraid of data. Um, it's we're going to use data. We're going to we're going to it's going to be there. Either we do it, somebody else is going to do it. We need it and we just need to manage it in the right way. And we need to be in the driving seat and not the ones driven. Uh, secondly, what we realize in the work we do is how rudimentary impact assessments really are. So we've got these sustainable development goals. We've got our climate goals, but at least in the environment in which we work, um, we don't know exactly how much progress we're making. So with VIDA, we want to really, you know, dig deeper into that and provide a tool to allow us to quantitatively assess the progress we're making and to be able to learn from mistakes we're making. Um, and uh, I think that's going to be really, really important because otherwise we're, we're not going to be able to connect between the level of large conversation, macro conversation and what happens on the ground. Okay, thank you. <laughs> It was very interesting, but too short. <laughs> Hope it was also interesting for the audience. And um, so I thank you for the attention for the, to the audience and um, wish a nice day. And um, thank you to both. <laughs> So a very big thank you from me to you, Torsten, for hosting this fascinating discussion and to the three of you. I thought it was really visionary and so important what you outlined, tying in so well also with our key themes of the day, the globality of the discussion that we're having here, the importance of data on these different layers. And I agree, it was too short. I hope we get to have many more discussions focusing in on the topics that you talked about in the last 30 minutes. So thank you very much to the three of you. Okay. We, <laughs> we are now going to head on another very short break. Do stay with us and just enough time to stretch and fill up your drink of your choice. And then we'll be back at 2.35 CEST for our next keynote, which is going to focus on diversion and inclusion and how important these factors are for the energy transition.